All right, hi, this is Dr. Daria. I want to thank everybody for joining our Hope Flies Health Series webinar. I wanted to remind everybody that this week is Global Mitochondrial Disease Awareness Week. And as part of increasing awareness, we're partnering with the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine, and they've organized this fascinating webinar. Today's scientific connection and interest in Alzheimer's disease and its connection with mitochondria is really growing. We're learning more and more. And we're specifically going to hear today about a research project that the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine and the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation have co-funded to explore this link further. We're also going to discuss some similar challenges that mitochondrial patients, patients with mitochondrial disease face with patients with Alzheimer's and how the day-to-day -day can be managed while they're discovering future treatment options. So just for a quick format overview, where each speaker is going to present on their various topics, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So we're going to just jump into some quick introductions. If you do have any questions that you want to submit to us live, we have a lot of people who submitted them early on, so thank you very much. We're going to try to get to those. But you can also submit them live now in, Google, in the Google Hangout using the Q&A button, or by going to our YouTube and putting it in the comments there, and we'll try to get to those. So some quick introductions. Myself, I'm Dr. Daria Longa Lespie. You can call me Dr. Daria. I'm an ER doctor and SVP of clinical strategy at ShareCare, which is a health engagement platform and home of the Real Age Test, where you can learn your body's real age and get actionable information on keeping it younger. I'm also author of the Busy Woman's Guide to Health and Sanity for ShareCare and the Huffington Post and host of ShareCare Radio. If you want to hear even more about mitochondrial disease, go over to our sharecare.com backslash RadioMD, and you can listen to the interview we did yesterday. So we at ShareCare are partners with the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine, and as a mother myself, I'm really excited to host today's webinar and learn more about the content, too. So let me just dive in and talk about some of our amazing panelists week today. We have Dr. Diana Scheinman. She's Director for Scientific Affairs at the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. Diana develops and manages the Foundation's drug discovery and development grant programs and strategic initiatives. She's combining scientific and business expertise. The ADDF manages its research funding portfolio to balance risk, stage of development, and drug target mechanism of action, and ensuring that grants meet key milestones before securing follow-on funding. We have Laura Stanley, who's the Executive Director for the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine. Laura joined the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine in January 2010 as their first Executive Director. Her professional experience is in corporate human resources, sales, and marketing, yet when Laura's eldest son was diagnosed in 2009 with a mitochondrial disease, she was desperate for answers and for hope, and mostly for a way to accelerate action. Lastly, we have Christy Balsells, Executive Director of MitoAction. Christy is a mom of three, including Eva, her youngest child who has Lee's disease, a serious form of mitochondrial disease. Christy is the author of Living Well with Mitochondrial Disease, a handbook for patients, parents, and families. Christy earned a master's in community and public health nursing from the University of Virginia in 2002 and subsequently created a community-based education program for new parents and their babies. So let's get started. Laura, we're going to dive in. Show us, talk about the connection between mitochondrial disease and Alzheimer's disease and the prize that our listeners can win. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Daria. So mitochondrial disease and specifically mitochondrial dysfunction are at the core of many related and familiar diseases that everyone really knows. Um, mitochondria is a, is a hard word, but what we've created is a little web of connectivity that hopefully everyone can visualize here sort of looks like um, a, a spokes on different on the wheel here. And if you'll see, mitochondrial dysfunction is at the center with many different diseases spoking out. And what we'd like to do is play a little interactive game. We call this, what is your firefly number? So everybody look at the web of connectivity. And next to each of the different diseases that you have listed here on the web of connectivity, indicate how many people you know that have this disease family members or friends or friends of friends. And if you add all of the number of your connections together, that's going to be your total firefly number. So sometimes it's interesting to realize that we are all more connected than we originally expected. And that's what we call our total firefly number. We call it our firefly number because, in fact, the firefly has mitochondria that are making its tail light glow. And so that's the connection with the firefly and the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine's logo. Uh, we have a prize for those who have the 
or the person who has the most connections on the web of connectivity and the highest Firefly number, if you'll submit that on our Facebook page, that's Facebook slash Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine, we'll send you a Firefly kit, which includes Christy Balsell's book, Living Well with Mitochondrial Disease, a Hope Flies Pandora style awareness feed and bracelet, and um, information from the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation on how to keep your cognitive um, abilities um, up to date and in good shape. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. And everybody can submit theirs and then hopefully win the prize. Love it. Now, I want to make sure we also dive a little bit deeper and we have one more slide about the web of connectivity activity. So did you want to touch base any more on that, Laura? No, I think that's great. Hopefully okay. everybody understands what I mean when I say the total firefly number. So just add the people that you know or the number of the people that you know, family members or friends, uh, by each of those related diseases and that will give you your total firefly number. I know. I was just looking at it myself and realizing it, it, my number with the, of people I knew was growing and growing. I was going to need to keep it down right down the list. It's amazing how it impacts so many people. So I want to move over to Diana now to talk about how a deeper dive in specifically about Alzheimer's. So can you tell us more about that, Diana? Sure, I'd be happy to. Hi, everyone. Uh, so it may seem a little bit strange to be talking about Alzheimer's disease when we're talking about um, childhood mitochondrial disease because Alzheimer's is at the other end of the aging spectrum. Uh, aging is the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Alzheimer's is a chronic progressive and ultimately fatal neurodegenerative disease. And symptoms, many of you may know people with Alzheimer's have a parent or grandparent that's suffering from the disease. Symptoms include memory loss, confusion, cognitive dysfunction, changes in mood and personality. And the disease starts off fairly mild and then will progress over time uh, to severe dementia. So uh, patients can often live for 15 years or more with, with the disease. Uh, about 50% of people over age 85 have Alzheimer's disease, uh, just one statistic there. And in total, it's about 5.1 million Americans living with the disease today. And it's the only top 10 cause of death that cannot be prevented, treated, or cured. So it's definitely um, a, a, an area where we need to, to, to develop some treatments. So if we dive into to what's happening in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, and I think this will draw us to our connection to mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, Al Alzheimer's disease was named after Dr. Alzheimer, uh, who was a doctor in Germany. And he had a patient, Auguste, uh, who exhibited symptoms of senile dementia. And when she passed away, he was able to take advantage of new laboratory techniques to examine her brain. <clears throat> and what he found when looking at the brain as a whole, if you see on the left of this slide here, uh, there's, with advanced Alzheimer's disease, I'm sorry, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback on the line. I don't know if um, there's anything you can do with, with that. But, um, so with advanced Alzheimer's disease, you can see that the brain is significantly smaller than a healthy brain. So there's significant atrophy and cell death that's occurring. Uh, in particular, the area circled in red here, this is the hippocampus region of the brain and surrounding cortex area that's most affected. This is the memory center of the brain, and that's what's most affected with the disease. So if we zoom in on this region, which is what is on the right side of the slide, what is in the brain on a microscopic level are these amyloid plaques, which, uh, or senile plaques, uh, which are kind of these just big globs and clumps of sticky protein that are clogging up the brain. And within the actual nerve cells, we also see tangles, these neurofibrillary tangles, which are composed of a protein called tau, that um, tw are twisted and, and mangled within the nerve cells and inhibit their function. So these are the main pathological hallmarks of the, of the disease. But there are many factors that are leading to there, there are many factors that are leading to, towards, thank you, to, towards the um, disease progression. So uh, there's inflammation in the brain, damaged proteins such as the amyloid and tau that are accumulating 
with with um, with the as the disease progresses. Uh, there's genetic risk factors. There's uh, vascular oxidative stress, and of course, there's neuronal energy failure, which is what we're really talking about today with the link to mitochondrial function. So, with Alzheimer's disease, you have all of these different factors coming in and playing a role over the lifespan of an individual, influencing disease progression, influencing the pathology, the plaques and the tangles that are accumulating in the brain, and ultimately leading to dementia. Um, so I, I think I'll stop there. We're going to talk more about this neuronal energy failure and the mitochondrial function contribution to Alzheimer's disease uh, a little bit later in the presentation, but this is definitely an area where there's overlap. Yeah, that's awesome, Diana. Thanks so much for taking us through the anatomy of it and really what happens within the brain and what contributes to Alzheimer's disease. You mentioned energy failure, so that's a great transition. I'm going to let Laura and Christy dive in to help us understand how that impacts Alzheimer's. Sure, great. Um, it, it is a perfect transition. In fact, on the next slide, you'll see a few images here. And you know, the question is, what do those images have in common? Well, if you realize, one is a, a power plant, one to the right there, that little cryptic um, this image or graphic looking like it comes from a textbook is actually the mitochondria and then there's the firefly and I gave uh, the answer away I suppose earlier when I mentioned FMM's logo but the firefly is actually making uh, its energy in the tail light because of something called luciferase in the mitochondria so all of that really is about energy the next slide will tell you a little bit more about mitochondrial disease, which really comes down to an energy production problem. Interestingly, it's the most common inherited metabolic disease there is, but it's not always inherited. And if, you, if we leave you with anything, it's really to help you understand that mitochondrial disease is really um, about an energy crisis. So it means the power plants in our cells don't function properly because um, they don't have the maximum productivity of making the energy that the body needs. So it's like the body has a power failure. On the next slide, we'll see that really mitochondrial disease has, um, is, is really complicated. In fact, the scientists have known about the mitochondria well before the 1900s, um, but it's only been in the last 30 years that the diseases themselves have been identified. So in some ways, it's, it's where many of our familiar diseases like autism or Alzheimer's were you know, 30 years ago. Um, it's still relatively obscure. It's certainly hard to say, but it's mu much more common than people realize. Um, the complication is that the mitochondria represent a really complicated enzyme system. So it requires over a thousand genes to actually function properly. And that means that patients can present in so many different ways. And the no two stories are alike. Um, any organ, any symptom, any age, it can have impacts that range from very mild to very um, severe and, and fatal. And that's what makes it really hard. Um, you know, my son's situation is completely different than Christy's daughter or adults that we may know with this disease. Um, so really, according to the CDC, it's really anywhere between 1 and 2,500 to 5,000 people that are affected by mitochondrial disease. Interestingly, it's actually more common than childhood cancer. In terms of just the different systems that are impacted, um, we can talk through um, some of the areas and the places that you'll see mitochondrial disease show up and that make it a little bit difficult back to the point that you know, no two stories are exactly alike. Um, it, it really comes down to the fact that you know, all sorts of systems are at play, whether it's the neurological system, the um, gastrointestinal system, the endocrine system, the cardiac system, the, um, the eyes, the uh, kidneys, a variety of those that can be impacted by the lack of energy. Christy, you want to tell us a little bit more about the different areas and places this shows up and the symptoms that we sometimes see? Sure, thank you. So you can see on this slide that one of the challenges in diagnosing mitochondrial disease is that mitochondria are in every cell 
So consequently, any cell and then any organ system could be impacted. And this could result in mild organ dysfunction or symptoms that you might see in a multitude of diseases. So part of pulling the connection together today between something like Alzheimer's and mitochondrial disease is because mitochondria play a, a really important role, we believe, in many diseases. And so when you look at this really interesting graphic here, you can see that there are going to be a variety of symptoms and even other diseases that may have a mitochondrial component. If you look on the next slide, we're talking about the signs and symptoms of mitochondrial disease. Now if you think about your mitochondria as a battery, which is fueling the cells of the body, that ATP is the battery charge, then you think about the organ systems which need the most energy. And it makes a lot of sense why then you might see, number one, a broad spectrum of disease, and number two, why the most energy-hungry organ systems would be affected. So think about how much energy it takes for the brain and central nervous system to function, how much energy it takes to process and digest our food properly, how much energy it takes for our muscles to work. And that helps us understand when you look at this listing of all of these different signs and symptoms, how that might be possible. What is challenging in mitochondrial disease then is that, is that, in that when you talk about patients who have a multitude of symptoms, it's very difficult to tease out one key issue or to really begin to understand that diagnosis. I like to think of mitochondrial disease sometimes with that analogy of a smartphone. We all have a, a smartphone and we depend on it and we have lots of apps and we use it. I know I use mine to help me with everything from reminding me when to give my daughter her medicines to tracking my own fitness to managing every minute of my day through a calendar and email. And if my battery starts to get down into the red and then my battery might get down into less than 10%, I know I'm in trouble. My apps aren't going to all be able to function properly. My phone is going to freeze up. I'm going to have issues and I'm going to have a harder time running the apps that take more energy. The body is the same way. So when there's this mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial disease, then those systems, again, primarily the muscles, the brain, and the GI system, start to shut down. So these are the reasons for referral on the slide we're looking at here, which make a lot of sense then if you think about the main organ systems which require or depend on the mitochondria the most. Now, I mentioned earlier, and you can move on to slide 19, that diagnosis is challenging. And briefly, a three-prong approach is considered um, appropriate for diagnosing mitochondrial disease, which again adds to the complexity of diagnosis because there is not necessarily a black and white test that can just tell us oh, I was tested for mitochondrial disease with a simple blood test, and yes or no, I have it. We are making a lot of progress in the field of genetic testing. So at this time, the understanding is that with a mitochondrial DNA mutation, so a genetic mutation in the mtDNA, which is inherited from your mother, about 15% of people who have a primary mitochondrial disease have a defect in their mitochondrial DNA. That's usually familial, it's passed on from the mother and you can look back and see that there are many people in the family history who had, if not diagnosed with mitochondrial disease, were diagnosed with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or things that maybe they look like mitochondrial disease but they didn't have the right name for their diagnosis at that time. The nuclear DNA mutations account for the other 85% of disease. Okay, it looks like we're gonna go ahead and move on to talking more about Alzheimer's now. Yes. Christy, thank you so much. And again, it bears repeating for all of our listeners, it can seem so confusing because we're talking about so many different conditions, but the thing that all of these organs have in common, from brain to gastrointestinal tract to muscles, they all have mitochondria. And that's, what they, that's why we're discussing this, because a problem in those mitochondria leads to that energy crisis, which is in common with all these conditions. We're going to have Diana speak a little more specifically, again, on the tie between mitochondrial disease and Alzheimer's, though. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I think in addition to having a genetic defect in mitochondria, you can also just have mitochondria dysfunction with aging. And so with Alzheimer's disease, 
you have an accumulation of these age-related defects. Um, and because, you know, as, as Christy was saying, the brain is particularly vulnerable to changes in, in energy utilization because it's such a, an energy-rich uh, organ. Um, that's why we have a lot of uh, symptoms manifesting in that place, and that's why it can exacerbate some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So the idea is that novel therapies that can correct defects in how the mitochondria are functioning may have the potential to impact many different diseases, so from early childhood genetic diseases to late-life neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. So it's, it's an exciting opportunity to be able to learn from each other to develop uh, new therapies. Um, so on the next slide, it's a little bit of a recap. We heard about how mitochondria are often caused, called the, the power plants of the cell, and they are in every cell, and they convert glucose and fats into usable energy. So the brain accounts for only 2% of our body weight, but, it, but uses over 20% of our body's total energy requirements. So like I, like I said, it is a very um, energy-rich area that, that needs a high degree of, of mitochondria function. So if there are defects, that's one of the first places you might see it. Um, in addition, mitochondria, in addition to regulating energy metabolism, they're also involved in, in cell death pathways. So in Alzheimer's, you have brain cells that are dying, and mitochondria may also be uh, playing a role at this, at this point as well. So they do have multiple functions. And as mitochondria are damaged with aging or just with uh, living on Earth and um, defects accumulating over time, they can also cause damage by releasing oxidative stress and causing damage to DNA and to um, the neuron cells and, and to membranes, and this can actually exacerbate the tangles that I showed earlier and the plaques that I showed earlier, um, making Alzheimer's disease worse, even if it's not a primary cause uh, in some cases. So on the next slide, we, we know that uh, we see energy just function early in Alzheimer's disease, and the reason why we know this is through brain imaging studies. So um, on the next slide, you can see some brain imaging of patients at different stages of the disease in Alzheimer's disease. So at the earliest stage with mild cognitive impairment, if you do a, a PET brain scan looking for uptake of uh, glucose or radio-labeled glucose, you can see in the normal brain there's lots of activity, lots of red, um, bright red activity. With mild cognitive impairment, which is one of the earliest stages of Alzheimer's, you see more of the black in the center, that's showing less activity. And as patients progress to Alzheimer's disease, you see even more of this black, so even less um, energy utilization occurring in the brain, and that's um, due to some of the cells dying and um, lack of activity in the brain correlated to, to reductions in memory and with dementia. So this is something that it starts to happen very early on in the disease, and I think this just uh, provides more evidence that if we have treatments that can target this energy dysfunction and improve it uh, early, early on in the disease progression, we can hopefully intervene and uh, slow Alzheimer's progression uh, as well as potentially applying these therapies to other diseases. Thank you so much, Diana. Now, Laura, I want you to tell us a little bit more about what FMM and ADDF are doing to do exactly this and find treatments for this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it's really important, as Diana was highlighting, the, the connections here among these different diseases. And so the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine strategically has set forth a collaboration strategy to partner with related disease groups. And we were very excited to connect with the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation um, who were interested in co-funding a research project on mitochondrial dysfunction. So philosophically, we really hope that the rising tide can lift multiple boats and if we focus on the common denominator that is one of the causes of um, Alzheimer's as well as other diseases, then it's not only going to help the Alzheimer's patients but will help the mitochondrial disease patients. So in 2013, we launched an RFP to derive innovative translational research and really we're looking at several different priority areas um, but to focus on 
the discovery or the development of mitochondrial dysfunction, whether it be biomarkers, whether it be validating some mitochondrial assays for new drugs, repurposing existing drugs, um, or looking at new drugs that might alter mitochondrial function. So we were really excited to do that and gosh, you know, I think um, as Christy will talk about here later this afternoon, in the last five, six years since my son was diagnosed with this disease, I've found that more and more drugs and more and more research has been focused on mitochondrial dysfunction. And so it was really exciting with this project that we worked together with the ADDF to see um, so many responses. We got some great responses and um, ended up then moving forward to select um, a participant or a, a, a um, recipient of our grant uh, from Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, the next slide will tell you a little bit about the project and then Diana can get into some specifics. Um, but we gave a $200,000 grant to Dr. James Bennett of Virginia Commonwealth University and his study was really to determine if boosting mitochondrial function in mice that had been engineered to develop Alzheimer's disease would actually improve um, their memory and cognitive function. Um, because we often see too in terms of mitochondrial disease children and adults have cognitive uh, fatigue or cognitive impairments uh, just like Diana was describing the brain requires so much energy and so much oxygen that cognitive fatigue shows up very frequently for patients with mitochondrial disease so this was an exciting project um, Diana you want to tell everybody a little bit more about the specifics and how things have evolved Sure. Thanks, Laura. Uh, so this project that we funded uh, at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University is studying a, a recombinant transcription factor, RHT fam, and the idea is that that this agent will increase the number of mitochondria and and also the we hope the function of the mitochondria um, to uh, improve how well cells are functioning. And doc in this study, Dr. Bennett injected this agent uh, intravenously into an Alzheimer's disease mouse model. So these are mice that are kind of genetically engineered to uh, mimic certain aspects of Alzheimer's disease. And um, he is measuring and it, whether the, the agent improves cognition improves the brain functioning in these animals as well as whether it actually improves the mitochondria function itself. So uh, he has done some previous studies in aged mice showing that this agent in increases mitochondria function. Um, so, so we hope that it has the potential to do the same in, in humans that have impaired cognition uh, and, and Alzheimer's disease as well as applying potentially to, to other uh, mitochondrial diseases. So the way that Dr. Bennett tested uh, whether TFAM could improve memory performance in these quote-unquote Alzheimer's mice is, with, is through a test called the Morse water maze. So you actually put the mice in a big tank of water, uh, one mouse at a time, and there's a hidden platform and the mice will swim around uh, trying to find that platform because they want to get out of the water. Um, and they look at how long it takes for the mice to uh, remember where the platform is if they go in you know, time and time again. They learn where it is and they can typically get there faster. But when mice are impaired, uh, when they are genetically engineered to have these Alzheimer's deficits, it takes them longer to find the platform and they don't really remember where the platform is. So um, on the right hand side in this bar graph, what, what Dr. Bennett is showing in this uh, data graph is that when mice were treated with the TFAM, they got to the platform faster. So it seems to show that it's improving their memory. And in addition to improving memory, he's also looking at other factors, looking at improvement in, uh, in the synapses to, to see if the cells are um, maintaining their, their function and, and are you know, not dying like they normally do, and uh, also validating that it is improving mitochondria. So this initial result is very encouraging. Um, the the TFAM molecule is in development by a biotech company called Gencia. There's still a lot more testing to do. Um, I think on the next slide, um, there's a little bit more information. So um, 
So Gencia has to do more testing about on the, the safety of the agent and um, making sure that it can be manufactured in a way that it could be used in humans. It has not been tested in humans yet, um, but I think it is encouraging that this treatment or others like it may have a positive effect on Alzheimer's patients and, as well as potential for, for other uh, mitochondrial diseases. Thank you, Diana. That's, that's absolutely fascinating and really exciting that they may be finding some targets to treat for patients with Alzheimer's, which as you mentioned has such a massive effect on people in the United States and globally, but it's also other conditions affected by mitochondrial dysfunction. So Laura's going to dive into what are some other studies because as we mentioned, the, the effects of mitochondrial disorder are so broad and so many targets. So Laura, tell us more of about, or Christy actually, can tell us more about some of the trials on the horizon. Sure, thanks Dr. Darius. So this is a fabulous quote here from Dr. Wallace saying mitochondrial drugs are going to revolutionize Western medicine. I really believe that this field has changed so much in the last five years. It's that connection now that the field of mitochondrial medicine as a broader field is making between not just primary mitochondrial dysfunction and the genetic diseases that I was referring to earlier, but between secondary mitochondrial dysfunction meaning you may have an acquired mitochondrial disease or a mitochondrial dysfunction that is related in another disease like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes, cancer, Huntington's disease. And so this, this broader approach to figuring out how we can address the mitochondrial dysfunction in order to improve mitochondrial health has real hope for children like my daughter, like Laura's son, and the many adults and children who have mitochondrial disease, but also for really our population population as a whole because as we age our mitochondrial function declines. This is a great um, URL from our website mitoaction.org slash study. If you're interested in this I encourage you to take a look because there's some really exciting trials evolving from some companies that are very forward thinking in how understanding primary mitochondrial disease and treatments could really have an impact not just on that orphan drug population, but actually on really a spectrum of diseases which affect the community as a whole. I think that's great, Christy. Um, we also are finding that just more and more mitochondrial-based clinical trials are existing, which is what you were emphasizing there. I mean, it feels to me like I get a Google alert every week about some new study, some new research institution, and some new pharmaceutical company, even young pharmaceutical companies going public that have an interest in mitochondrial dysfunction for their drug therapies. So it's really exciting. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of the therapeutic drug discovery projects that we've done, um, specifically with the ADDF that Diana shared with you. We also partnered with the Michael J. Fox Foundation to co-fund some research on the Parkin gene, which has been known to impact the health of the mitochondria. And uh, Parkin gene is one of the areas that is um, the primary recessive gene for causing Parkinson's. Um, just this week, too, we're announcing that we, um, in conjunction with the University of Alabama at Birmingham and a biotech company called Seahorse Bioscience, are launching a new mitochondrial medicine program and clinic um, that will also have some research components to it. Um, as Christy's described, the mitochondrial diseases, because of their complexity and because they can affect adults and children at varying stages and ages, um, oftentimes the patient community is um, is adrift and uh, doctors are confused by the disease itself and not quite sure how to orient. So um, we're excited that the University of Alabama at Birmingham has taken an interest in this and are going to partner to uh, launch a new clinic that will be a great resource for a multidisciplinary approach to the different specialists that the patient community needs to see. Um, whether they're a, whether it's a cardiologist or a gastroenterologist or a neurologist or a geneticist, um, it gets very complex. And so that's going to be um, an exciting way to tie that into the research component that we're also hopeful will come about. 
Yeah, Laura, that's a great, great organization and great partnership because as you mentioned, people with mitochondrial disorders may have so many different specialists that they need to see and have trouble connecting all of that, but they can go to this one center and kind of put all their specialists right in the same place. Right, right. Something brand new and it's going to be great that it, um, it comes together. So um, looking forward to seeing how that transpires. Awesome. All right, Diana, tell us a little bit more about some hope with the Alzheimer's research. Sure, yeah, I think it's a little bit different in Alzheimer's in the sense that there's a huge market and a huge number of patients that are suffering. So our issue is that um, a lot of the, the pharmaceutical companies and the venture capital investors are, um, you know, risk averse. They're investing in these, these larger programs. But there's a, a really important role that philanthropy can play and that, that we play at the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation and trying to get novel therapies such as these mitochondria targeted therapies uh, through the, the pipeline, um, de-risking them so that they can be picked up by some of these larger partners and, and actually reach, um, reach the patient populations. Uh, so, so it is exciting in Alzheimer's right now. We do have a number of, of late stage clinical trials that, that are being run by pharmaceutical companies targeting the amyloid and the tau that I talked about earlier, early on, um, those, those clumps of protein that are accumulating in the brain. Uh, so we'll see how those turn out. But in the meantime, um, on the next slide, this just shows ADDF's portfolio. We're targeting a number of different targets. We're targeting therapies that protect the brain. Um, so um, we're targeting some portion, um, sorry, if you can move to the next slide, this shows the, the diverse uh, approaches that we're taking. I think patients at different stages of the disease will need different drugs. So we're not going to have one drug for Alzheimer's. I think we'll need different drugs depending on uh, what stage we're at. Sorry, <laughs> if you can go back, back one slide is the one that I was looking for. Um, and we'll also likely need different combinations of drugs for different patients depending on their unique factors that are causing the disease. So that's why we're supporting these, this diverse array of targets, uh, looking for drugs that protect the brain or protection. This energy utilization, which is the mitochondria component, is also an important part of our portfolio, uh, as well as in, um, drugs that are targeting inflammation, as well as genetic risk factors. So there's a, we're learning a lot about Alzheimer's. There's a lot of treatments that are, are pushing through the pipeline. and I think we'll have some answers soon, but while we're waiting for these therapies to make it to patients, to make it through the, the long testing that's required, um, what can people do to prevent Alzheimer's disease today? So this is on the next slide. I, I think there's um, aspects to, to the environment, so um, leading a healthy lifestyle, healthy diet. It said, you know, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Um, also maintaining um, cognitive engagement, both socially as well as, um, as, well as uh, cognitively, you know, staying, staying um, mentally active. Uh, so, so there are some things you can do today, and we are learning from some large epidemiology studies that these are making a difference in delaying when people are getting Alzheimer's disease. And if you want to learn more about uh, Alzheimer's prevention, encourage you to visit one of ADDF's websites, cognitivevitality.org, which has some, some useful resources. And I'll turn it over back to, to Daria to tell you about some other resources as well. Thank you so much, Diana. So yes, let's hop to the next slide so we can make sure that all of our viewers can see a number of different resources. Um, number one, obviously the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine. We've been talking about that today, and that's hopeflies.org. We have MitoAction, we also have the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, and of course we have ShareCare. And on ShareCare you'll find a lot more information on the specific topic, information in a profile page for the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine. And again, you can take the real age test, learn more about your body's real age, so just some great information there. So I want to now take this time to kind of dive into some of our questions and answers that we've gotten from people who had submitted them. So the very first one was, are scientists suggesting that Alzheimer's may be a primary mitochondrial disease or a secondary one? And how does that affect the approaches to research and treatment? Diana, do you want to take that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so, so I think um, Alzheimer's is complicated because uh, there's so many different 
types of Alzheimer's. There might be many different causes of Alzheimer's. Um, it's, kind of, it, it's a diverse disease. Um, so we do think that mitochondrial dysfunction is, is playing a role in the disease, um, either in uh, triggering how the disease progresses. Um, but and in some cases, it, it, it may be possible that there might be mitochondria mutations, which could be an initial driver. Um, although we do need more, more research to, to learn more about if that's the case. Um, there certainly is a lot of research underway trying to understand more about the causes of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but I think it is clear that, that treatments that target the mitochondria will hopefully help to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease and um, could be used in combination with, with other therapeutic approaches as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I think that makes perfect sense, like what you explained, that targeting the, the mitochondria can help Alzheimer's and hopefully other conditions as well. Now, regarding mitochondrial disease, you know, everybody feel free to jump in for this one. Can active disease, if somebody has a diagnosis, be halted? Could the progression be halted or reversed? Feel free to jump in. Hey, Laura, why don't you take that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think, you know, with mitochondrial diseases, it's a little bit different than Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, for example, where some of those different diseases might have neuronal death. Um, I think in the mitochondrial diseases, what we're finding is, yes, that we can uh, start to repair the mitochondria and then impact and improve the function and the way the disease is manifesting itself. Um, right now, and Christy, feel free to add to this, there haven't been specific drug therapies um, that are mainstream, so to speak. So oftentimes people with mitochondrial disease will take what they call the mitochondrial cocktail, which ends up being a combination of various natural substances, supplements, excuse me, like um, CoQ10 or carnitine. Some people who might have a cerebral folate deficiency, however, can take something called leucoborin, and that um, really has made a significant improvement in their um, stability and their muscle function. So people that weren't walking uh, very steadily before are now able to walk in part because of the leucoborin that they might be taking. Um, but often we end up treating the symptoms and not necessarily the root cause. So we can think of the people that might have seizures or taking seizure medicine, just like the epilepsy patients might, or attention difficulties. They might be taking the... Um, the um, ADHD types of medicines. And I know, Diana, you've um, been studying, too, some of the ADHD medications about how they might impact uh, the Alzheimer's community, too, right? Wasn't there a study with was it Stratera or something that... Um, yes, we're currently funding a study of, of uh, Stratera for, for Alzheimer's at Emory University. And I think it's an example of repurposing, which is, which is kind of what we're, we're talking about in general here, is taking drugs that are approved for one condition and applying it to other conditions. And it's a way to, I think, be efficient. You know, if we've already passed through a number of the, the safety hurdles with it, with one drug, we certainly want to see, you know, how many other disease conditions it might benefit as well. Um, but, but yeah, just to, to go back to the question for Alzheimer's, I think if we could halt the disease, that would be the, the holy grail. Um, that would be... A, that, that's what we're all trying to do. Right now, the treatments that are, that are available from your doctor for Alzheimer's are all targeted to the symptoms. They can help improve some of the symptoms of the disease, uh, but we don't yet have a, a treatment that will uh, delay the progression or halt the progression, but hopefully we will soon. Laura, I'd like to add a comment also about um, can active disease be halted? This is Christy. I don't think that active disease can be halted. I think it's important to recognize that you can slow the progression and manage symptoms. Mm. But really, thinking about managing mitochondrial disease, while it's extremely important for people who have a mitochondrial dysfunction or primary mitochondrial disease, it's actually very important for anyone to think about how to better manage your mitochondria. Uh, the four main approaches that I tend to recommend are being very um, active and aggressive in your hydration, nutrition, infection control, and regulation, which means um, you know controlling the environment so that you aren't overheated 
or your body's not having to work too hard to kind of maintain what's called homeostasis or status quo of how your body should be operating comfortably. So when you have a physiologic stress, like you have a fever, then in a person with mitochondrial disease, that can be really devastating because of the additional demand. But when we take the supplements and we're protecting the body with ample hydration, really clean nutrition, using infection control and really kind of keeping our mitochondria as healthy as possible and it's supported in the cell, then although people with mitochondrial disease and mitochondrial dysfunction are going to experience the symptoms related to mito, like debilitating fatigue, for example, or cognitive issues or developmental delay in children and so forth, even that very fundamental approach, which I think is often overlooked because we go straight to thinking about drug targets, is really important. So even if um, and even when we have um, options for actual therapeutics on the horizon, I think it's still important to think about how you manage your mitochondria in order to slow the progression. And that's true for children as well as adults with disease. Yeah, Christy, that's a great point. And, and Diana, I'm sitting there chuckling to myself thinking those points were made at one of the symposiums that you have organized. Some of the Alzheimer's experts were saying the exact same thing in terms of um, the type of uh, diet that you have, the type of nutrition, the type of exercise. Um, all of that is consistent. And so it's like we can sort of delete mitochondrial disease in Christie's comments, insert Alzheimer's or other other diseases because it seems to hold true across multiple areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And with, you know, I think it's maintaining a healthy lifestyle is just so important for so many different diseases, heart disease, cancer. Um, so it's you definitely can't uh, overemphasize that point too much. Yeah, that's, that's great, Dana. You kind of mentioned some of the proactive ways that people can reduce their risk of Alzheimer's, but it always bears repeating that having that kind of healthier lifestyle can indeed reduce someone's risk for uh, progression, correct? Right. Awesome. Um, then, you know, I have, I'm going moving on to our next question from one of our listeners. They had said that I already have mild, moderate cognitive issues due to my mitochondrial condition. I'd like to understand the risk and link to progression to dementia or Alzheimer's. I guess, and you know, does it mean they'll absolutely develop Alzheimer's or dementia or not? I think it's unfortunately a hard question because we don't have that much information um, in terms of longitudinally following patients with mitochondrial disease over time until they're 75, 80 years old, which is, you know, after age 70 is when most people develop Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, it's a done deal. I think there's certainly a lot of, a lot of room to, um, you know, I don't think anyone should, should worry too much and do what you can to, to manage your current condition. Um, and we just need more research to understand how, how the risk affects Alzheimer's disease in the future. Okay, which is why it's great that so much is going on and really appreciate that. And our last, just last question, I'd like to, to go to each of you. If you could leave every, but our listeners with one thing, what would that be? Laura, can we start with you? Oh gosh, I guess the, the one thing I would say is that you know, mitochondrial disease is more common than people realize and if you, if I could ask people to do one thing, it would be to help spread the word and help people understand that we're all connected and uh, that really, as Christy pointed out, the resurgence and focus on mitochondrial function is going to really make such a huge difference going forward and that's really what excites me the most. Um, so um, when I think about my web of connectivity personally, my grandmother that had Alzheimer's or my grandfather that had Parkinson's or mother with diabetes or child with mitochondrial disease, you know, we're all so linked and I think if we can continue this focus and spread the awareness, that's going to lead to more collaboration and it's going to lead to more treatments. Wonderful. Thank you. What about you, Christy? I would say that uh, I'd second your what you said, but I'd also add that um, for anyone who is listening and who's struggling with a mitochondrial disease or any neurodegenerative disease, you are your own best advocate. That as this field is evolving, we are pioneers together. 
and that the patients who are dealing with the symptoms of the disease are just as important as the people who are doing the research in the lab and that it really is that level of advocacy where the patient voice is going to help shape how we can treat these diseases because mitochondrial disease and mitochondrial dysfunction is as we've learned today very complex and can be a little bit slippery to really identify it becomes even more important that we have a way to really galvanize the patient community so I encourage people who are listening to recognize the value that you have in sharing your story and in sharing your voice and being part of this effort because truly we are the people who are revolutionizing the field of mitochondrial medicine together Yes, thank you, Christy. It's true. They're, you're all stronger together when we do this together. Diana, what are your last parting words? Sure. Yeah, I think I think those are great points that, that Laura and Christy both raised. And I think um, you know we, we know so much more than, than we have known in the past. We're continuing to learn more about all these different diseases, about mitochondria dysfunction, about different therapies. But we, we do need to be investing more in research. You know, we need more research. We need more funding for research. Um, both the government and through foundations and so I think it's, it's just important that we're all you know engaged in contributing and you know I guess non-financially also enrolling in clinical trials if you have you know any of these different diseases that we talked about today just um, supporting the research so that we can get closer to effective treatments that can delay or halt uh, disease progression in the future. Awesome thank you so much and you know Christy, Diana, Laura, this has been awesome. I, I want to thank you for the opportunity for me to work with you and, and listen in on it. I just want to also add that it see, you know, for mitochondrial disorders, it just literally seems that we're at the very tip of the iceberg, and it's we're learning so much about it affects so many conditions, but that makes it also very difficult to diagnose because, as you mentioned, it affects so many different organs and in many different ways, which makes targeted treatments even harder. But that's exactly why we need webinars like this and more partnerships so that the money can be put behind it to find solutions for these conditions that you know, affect so many of us. The numbers are huge that you mentioned. So thank you so much. Uh, and I want all of our listeners to know if they have any other questions, there are ways that we can answer them. We would love to get them from you. First, submit them via email. You can email to info at mitochondrialdiseases.org or you can tweet us, tweet at foundmm for the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine, tweet me at Dr. Daria. We would love to hear from you and we are so grateful for your time today. Thank you.